The second lesson from God's Word, which also serves as the sermon text for today, from St. Peter's first letter, chapter 3, verses 15 to 22. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This, too, is the word of our God. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace be with all of you. Friends in Christ our Savior, within the last couple of weeks, a local church has begun advertising on the radio station that I listen to. And the whole thrust of the, the pitch that they're making to encourage people to join them for worship on Sunday is just try it. And they offer a number of reasons why you should just try it. Just try it. They're very informal. The pastor doesn't even wear a robe when he speaks. Just try it. The music is rocking. It really, really gets in your soul and sticks with you. Just try it. The kids have lots of fun. In fact, the kid area is so much fun. Often it's the kids dragging the parents to church. That has to be a good thing, right? So just try it. Well, with the fear of being a little bit too critical and certainly not intended to be judgmental in any sort of way. I have to admit, whenever I hear that radio ad, I can't help but ask, where's Jesus? I mean, there's no mention of Jesus anywhere in that ad, no mention of a need that we would have for Jesus or really any of our spiritual need at all. No mention of sin, grace, forgiveness, or heaven. No mention at all of the, the, the good news of the gospel. Think to myself, great, you, you have a, an informal church that has rock and music and, and the kids have lots of fun, but where, where's the hope in that? Where do you find something solid to stand on when the troubles and tragedies of life start coming your way? Where do you find that anchor to, to hold fast when the winds of, of difficulty and challenge begin buffeting you like a tree in a hurricane? I mean, that message isn't going to offend anyone or cause anyone to react negatively to it. But where's the peace and the hope? I bring this up, not, not to ridicule anyone, but simply to highlight some important truths about evangelism and gospel outreach. It can become very easy as we get involved in, in evangelism and gospel outreach to want to highlight our church and our programs and those earthly activities that might attract others and lose sight of what truly brings peace and hope, which is the message of Jesus our Savior. You see, the goal of our evangelism and our outreach is not to get people to church or to grow our membership or help with the budget. The goal is to share the love of Jesus with others. 
to help them know the eternal life Jesus won and has given to them freely through grace, and to give them hope to stand on in all phases of life. See, God's given one mission to His church. That, that's both to all of us collectively as a gathering of believers, but also to each one of us individually. Go and make disciples of all nations. Today, Peter issues a personal call to evangelism to each one of us. That in light of the resurrection victory that God has so graciously given to us in Jesus, he encourages us not only to hold tightly to our faith in the midst of opposition, but to be ready to share with others the hope that we have in Jesus. See, that's evangelism. In fact, Peter focuses our attention on the heart and soul of evangelism, the goal that we are striving toward in, in all of our work to reach out to our world. It's not about our church or our synod or our little kingdom here at Northdale. It's about sharing the hope that we have for eternal life in Jesus, our Savior. So let's listen closely today as Peter refreshes us with some timeless truths for evangelism. Now Peter starts out the first truth by saying, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. I guess that's one way of saying evangelism starts inside of us. That made sense. The, the best sales people are the ones who truly believe in their product. I mean, we can tell the difference between someone who's selling because that's just his job to sell and someone who's selling because she really believes that her product will help you. Now, we're not selling anything in outreach and evangelism, but there certainly are <coughs> many parallels. Evangelism starts by setting apart Christ Jesus as Lord in our heart. To set up our Christ as Lord means to, 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 that Christ rules in our heart. It means setting Christ as the, the top priority in our heart, giving Him first place in our lives. It means what Christ wants for us, trumps what we want for us. It means not only knowing in Christ and, and believing in Christ, but then letting that show in the life that you live. It means not only trusting in Him for forgiveness and eternal life, not only looking to Him for protection and care, but putting that into display as you live out your life. Boy, do we need that reminder. People hate hypocrisy. They can smell religious hypocrisy from miles away. Hypocrisy is when you believe one thing, but, but do something else. Hypocrisy would be saying that we are Christian, and then living in a way that's completely opposite of the way that Christ wants of us. People can tell when our faith is phony, and it really doesn't mean that much to us. And boy, how that lessens the effect of any message we might share when our life doesn't back up what it is that we're saying. You see, we all have those selfish passions that find their way seeping out from our sinful nature that need to be rebuked each and every day. This concept of setting apart Christ as Lord is an action that really needs to be repeated day in and day out, that every day we reaffirm the Christian faith in our heart. Every day we rededicate our lives to God's service. That, that, that happens by confessing our sins and looking to our Lord Jesus for forgiveness and then going out to live to God's glory. That, that every day our goal is to live to the honor and glory of our God. That every day we, we pray for strength to, to stand up for the truth. That every day we sit and listen to our Savior's wonderful word. Because it's when our hearts are full of gratitude and having been rescued from death and hell that we're really truly prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. And when we give an answer for the hope that we have and our heart is full of gratitude to God, then 
And it's a message that comes with conviction. You see, evangelism starts inside of us. Peter goes on to the second truth. Always be prepared. See, I think if you look in your life, you would note that every single day, God gives us an opportunity, brings someone into our life with whom we can share the hope that we have in Jesus. It's important that we are ready to take advantage of those opportunities when they come. But I think we'd admit that many times we don't take advantage of those opportunities because of our fear. And, and that fear can come from a couple of different places. First, it can come from just not knowing what to say. You have that fear? I don't really know what to say, so I'll say nothing. It's good for us to, to think through. What would I say if someone asked me about my hope? It's good for us to be able to summarize our hope, our faith, in, in just a few sentences. It's really not that hard. Tell them about the fact that you're a sinner and deserve death because of it. Tell them how Jesus came down to this earth to live perfectly and then offered his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. Tell them how he rose from the dead. Not only to conquer death, but to proclaim his victory. And tell them how God graciously gives us that victory through faith. It's really that simple. It's really that easy. In essence, just give a reason for the hope that you have. And that's the third truth. You don't have to struggle to come up with the perfect sales pitch. You don't have to argue with people. You don't have to develop some reasonable or, or, logic, or logical argument or be clever or, or, or take on your own shoulders the burden of converting people. Just tell them the truth. Tell them what happened to you. God's given every one of you a story about His grace in your life. Just tell your story. That hope that you have in Jesus as Lord and Savior from sin will make an impression on others. The sure and certain hope of the Christian faith along with the glorious future that awaits stands in, in stark contrast to the hopelessness of our world. We live in an age of uncertainty. Nobody trusts anybody today. That you would stake your hope in a God you haven't seen. That makes an impression on others. So many people live in our world lacking an absolute truth in their life. And for a while that sounds great, right? I mean, you get to make up your own truth in life. How cool is that? You get to be guided by your own truth. Except the unintended consequences that often leaves people just rudderless and drifting. Because suddenly nothing's certain. Everything's uncertain. And they don't know which way to turn. How different that is. From the sure and certain hope that you and I have. The confidence God has given us in the forgiveness of sins that were won through Jesus' sacrifice. The assurance of eternal life which God gives to us in Jesus. to share that hope. I mean, just putting your good clothes on to come to, to worship today leaves an impression on others. That's a witness. When your neighbors are, are taking care of their yard work and they see you come home having dedicated your morning to worship and Bible study, they now know what's important to you. And they might ask you, why? Why would you do that? Why would you give up that time week after week after week? And isn't there better answers than, well, because? Or that's just what we do. Or that's the way I was raised. That may be true. But aren't there better, deeper answers that would serve as better options? How about that? Because each week, I promise God, I'm going to live for His glory and in a way that pleases Him. And every week I fail. And Sunday, I get to come to God's house and hear God... Assure me of forgiveness. Remind me that heaven is still open because of Jesus and strengthen me with his love so I can, as I live this next week. Why would I not take advantage of that? 
always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Of course, we know that's not always easy because the other fear that we have is the way that people are going to react to us. And people don't always just accept these answers. Many will argue back. It doesn't matter what you believe, because all religions lead to the same place anyway, so go ahead and believe what you want. Others don't want to have to admit that they're sinful and deserve death from, for their sins, and they'll look down on those of us who believe that. Still others want to take their own pride, their own confidence of, of standing before God on their own, and and, and can be very condescending to those of us who admit our weakness and our need for help to stand before God and live with Him forever. At times like that, it, it's easy to slip into an argument or debate. And that's why Peter shares with us the last two truths. Be gentle and show respect. Nobody wants to hear evangelism from an aggressive, pushy know-it-all. Nobody wants to hear about God from someone who shoves it in their face and just won't stop talking about it. Puffing up our own denomination by ridiculing others is not a great way to go about things. There may be a time for careful discussion about the differences in denominations, but to a fallen away or a non-Christian, that's not the time. What they need is for us just to lift up Jesus and direct them to the love and healing that he alone can bring. And just remember what he's done for you. He died for you once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. That's the center of our hope and our joy. We're sinners who deserve death. And yet Christ willingly came down to this world to to pay that price for us. His one sacrifice covered all our sins. Even though we repeatedly sin day after day, week after week, His one act of atonement covers all of those sins. And after His death, He descended into hell to proclaim His victory over the devil. He rose from the grave to conquer death and then ascended up into heaven where He sits on heaven's throne guiding and ruling the affairs of this world for the good of his people. It's that hope that we have in Jesus that gives us confidence to continue sharing our hope, even if that means a little bit of suffering while we're here on earth. You see, it's possible that sharing our hope with others could lead to a situation that's personally embarrassing or potentially threatening. In some cases, maybe even life endangering. But with our hope placed in the God who conquered death and rules on heaven's throne, we can continue sharing that, conf that, that hope confidently regardless of what might come. See, the reality is because of all that Jesus has done, whatever suffering we might face here on this earth really doesn't matter. Because he conquered death, even if death were to temporarily claim the lives of his saints, that would mean that they were living with him forever in heaven. Jesus has already stormed the enemy's capital and raised the flag of a conquering victory. That means the devil's defeated. He has no power over us. Let him do what he will, even if that means some temporary earthly suffering here on this earth. He's already defeated. He can't harm us spiritually or eternity, eternally because our God has already won the victory. You know, maybe the best example of this is the one that Peter shares in our text out of Noah. He was besieged with wickedness in his day. Genesis tells us that the people of his day, the, the, every inclination of the thought of their heart was only evil all the time. Imagine the ridicule and mockery he faced for following God's command to build that ark in, a, in the desert. If God used the waters of the flood to destroy the world of that wickedness, and to save Noah and his family. And Peter tells us in a very similar way, God used the waters of baptism to save you. That through those waters of baptism, God washed away the dirt of your sin and brought you into his family. That means you are safe in God's hand, come with me. And that's 
that's the hope that gives us such confidence to boldly confess Christ's name and to continue proclaiming our hope no matter what kind of a reaction we get. So let's go and let the light of Christ shine through us. Let's go storm the capital of the enemy and proclaim to others the, the hope that we have. We don't need a slick sales pitch or a reasonable argument. Let's lead with Jesus. And let the Holy Spirit work through the, work through the Word of God that we share. No, you may not ever get to preach to thousands like Peter did on Pentecost. The harshness of God's law and the sweetness of His gospel. But every day, you get to share with your children and your spouse the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And how God uses that to rebuild, restore, and, and reinvigorate His people. You may never have to face the flames of physical persecution or martyrdom where your last breath is a bold declaration of Christ. But you may have the opportunity to share with your neighbor when he tells you that God is absent, distant, maybe even non-existent at all, and remind him how much he cares by pointing him to the cross of Jesus and how he carried his sin. <coughs> You may never get to take a boat and cross the ocean to bring the gospel to people that time forgot. But you take part in gospel outreach at home and abroad through prayers and offerings. You may never face the lions, be robbed of your possessions because of your faith, or have to flee as a religious refugee. But you can share with your co-worker who's given up on God that God hasn't given up on him. In fact, his abiding love, sufficient grace, and mercies continue to be new each and every day. Set apart Christ as the Lord of your heart. Be prepared and ready to share the hope that you have. Be gentle. Show respect. Remember your baptism and what God has done for you. Go out and share with others the hope that you have so they can share in that same hope too. May God bless us as we go about his work and keep before our minds these timeless truths of evangelism. Please stand.